tuning in, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. So far, we've considered physics and biology in our exploration of scripture and science. Today, we begin to consider how earth science and the Bible fit together. This becomes particularly significant when considering interpretations for Noah's flood. We'll get to that next time. But for today, our teacher will lay out the basics of geology and earth science to give us a good overview. He'll also cover radiometric dating, which has a bearing on how scientists determine the age of the earth. Here now is episode 473, What is Earth Science? with Will Barlow. Welcome back to Scripture and Science. We're in session 12 now, and we've talked already about physics and astronomy. We've talked about biochemistry and evolution, and now it's time for us to transition to our third major branch of science that we're going to discuss in this class, and that's geology, earth science, and atmospheric science. So as we talk about geology, earth science, and atmospheric science, the three big things we're going to talk about are geology as a whole, uh, what is geology? What are some of the things that geologists say about the world around us? We're going to talk about important cycles. Uh, the water cycle is a big one. We're going to briefly mention the carbon and nitrogen cycles. And then we're going to spend some time talking about plate tectonics because it's fun. When we talk about geology, really a lot of it's about rocks. So we're going to talk about uh, the types of rocks, the rock cycle. We're going to talk about geological principles. So principles that geologists use as they study geology and rock formations and things like that. We're going to spend a good deal of time talking about dating methods uh, because dating methods is, is really one of the big things uh, that we need to understand as we relate uh, scripture and science together on this particular field. And then we're going to talk about the structure of the earth. That'll lead into our discussion later on plate tectonics. So, what is geology? Well, geology is the study of the earth and the processes related to the earth. I think in simple terms, we can say that geologists, a lot of them, study rocks and the rock cycle. And there's a lot of different applications of that. For example, in the oil and gas industry, you need geologists. You need people to tell you what type of rocks you should drill into and what type of rocks you don't want to drill into and what where likely oil deposits are and where it's less likely to have oil deposits, all those types of things. That's more of a mineralogy, sort of a subdivision of geology. There are other subfields, atmospheric studies, including like meteorology. So when you turn on the news and you get your weather report or you pull out your weather app on your phone or whatever the case might be, you're getting information from geologists. These people have studied geology professionally and they focused in on atmospheric studies and meteorology. Uh, there's also volcanology, that's studying volcanoes, which is something, as of a couple of years ago, my son was really interested in. <laughs> I don't know if he's still into <laughs> lava and magma as much as he was, but, uh, but it is appealing to some people, and I can tell you I think lava is cool too. So, so some people study lava professionally. They study volcanoes professionally. Talking about rocks, there are three major categories of rocks. Uh, you have sedimentary rocks, and that's formed by pressure acting on sediment. Sediments like sand or dirt, loose materials. And so sedimentary rocks are formed by pressure over time acting on sediment. Uh, igneous rocks are formed by lava. So lava comes out of a volcano, and eventually it cools down, and you can pick up volcanic rock, igneous rock, and you can see black, black sand beaches and stuff that were formed by igneous rock. So that's fun. Then you also have metamorphic rock. Metamorphic rock uh, were formed by extreme pressure and heat, usually lower down under the earth's surface. And some of us some days probably feel like metamorphic rocks, like you're dealing with extreme pressure or heat. Um, thankfully, we don't deal with those conditions physically. Uh, that would be very dangerous. So here is a visual description of the rock cycle. 
And the idea here is wind and water are constantly affecting change on our Earth's surface. So you have rivers, you have rain, and those things uh, erode sediments and, and deposit them elsewhere. And over time, all these things happen. And so rocks go through the, the rock cycle. In other words, you could have sedimentary rock that doesn't say sedimentary rock forever. It could become metamorphic rock. It could become igneous rock, depending on where it's located and what kind of processes it comes into contact with. So, so over time, you have all these different things going on. You have weather. I'm going to start in the upper left-hand corner. You have weathering of rocks at the surface. You get erosion and transport, uh, the deposition of sediment, burial and compaction. That leads you to sedimentary rock. Eventually, if it gets underneath the Earth's surface far enough, you get deformation and metamorphism. So that's, as the further you go down, the higher the heat, the higher the pressure, and eventually that rock can actually change uh, its structure and become a metamorphic rock. And eventually, if it keeps going down further and further into the mantle, it can get completely melted and become recrystallized after it comes out of a volcanic event, and then it becomes igneous rock. And sometimes, you know, all these things are working in, in parallel or in conjunction with one another. So we can view it as a sort of linear cycle like this, but you can also view it like this. Very basically what it's saying is, um, if you start with sedimentary rock, you get heat and pressure, it becomes a metamorphic rock. If it completely melts, it becomes magma, it crystallizes, it becomes igneous rock. If it just straight up melts, it goes to magma, and then it crystallizes and becomes igneous rock. So this is just another description of how all these things happen, and metamorphic rock and igneous rock can be weathered, eroded, and, and moved from one place to another, and then and settle down in an area, and then if it gets compacted and cemented, then it becomes sedimentary rock. So all the surface of the earth, whole Earth, over time, it's getting affected by, by the elements, and as, as it gets affected by the elements, all these, th all these different things can happen over a long period of time. And so we end up with three major categories of rock. We also end up with things sort of in between phases, like magma or like sediment, for example. So that's the rock cycle in a nutshell. Transitioning now to geological principles, there are several main principles of geology. Uh, three of them are superposition, cross-cutting relationships, and uniformitarianism. So superposition um, says that if you're talking about rock layers that have not been disturbed by tectonic activity, so these are undisturbed rock layers, that if you have a rock layer above, that's a younger rock layer. And if you have a rock layer below, that's an older rock layer. And I think that makes a good amount of sense, knowing what we know about how sedimentary rocks are formed and things like that. So superposition uh, seems to make sense. It seems to tell us that as we go deeper and deeper, we're getting essentially older and older layers. The principle of cross-cutting relationships says that if there is tectonic activity on a fault line, that the fault is younger than the layers it cut through. And again, it sort of makes sense, right? I mean, if you're, you're going to cut through something, it has to exist first. You can't, you can't cut through a cake and there be an imaginary cake and actually cut through it. The, the, cake, the cake has to exist before you cut into the cake. And now I'm getting hungry, but that's another story. So if a fault cuts through a layer of rocks, the fault happened after the rocks were already there. So that can be a way of helping us date things. The principle of uniformitarianism is really interesting, and I think it may be uh, perhaps the thing that's poked at the most by uh, creation scientists. And it's the idea that geological processes observed in the present have worked the same throughout all of history. And again, when we're talking about assumptions that scientists make, we can agree that generally that seems to make sense. I think the larger question is, can phenomenal events happen that would break these principles in a localized way without making it wrong in a global sense. And so I think those are the types of questions that we can ask as we relate uh, geology and the study of geology to what the Bible says about certain events that seem to have a geologic nature. So that third one, I think, is in some sense the most controversial 
of, it's sort of like the guiding principle of geology, and it, I think it, it can be seen as controversial for that reason. There are two different types of dating methods that I want to talk about. There's absolute dating and relative dating. And I know what some of you might be thinking. This is not talking about relationships. For example, <laughs> if I say my wife and I were absolutely dating, that is not what this is talking about. And relative dating is not talking about what I observed at times as I grew up in Arkansas. Okay? We are not, we're not talking about cousins dating. That's not what we're talking about. So what are we talking about? What is absolute dating? Absolute dating is based on radioactive decay. Okay, well what is radioactive decay? Well some forms of certain elements are by nature unstable. Just in the sense that maybe your Aunt Gertrude is unstable by nature, okay? <laughs> you just know there are certain things you don't bring up around Aunt Gertrude, right? Well some elements are by nature unstable. And over time, what that means from a scientific perspective is that these elements change on the atomic level. And so sometimes that means losing protons and neutrons. Sometimes it's an exchange of protons and neutrons. But anyway, th this is well observed in our modern time. We see this happening all the time. The most prevalent example of uh, absolute dating is carbon dating. And carbon dating uses the decay of carbon-14. And just as a really brief refresher on high school chemistry, there are three different major isotopes of carbon. The first two, carbon-12 and carbon-13, are way more common, especially carbon-12 is like 98.5% of the carbon we observe on our Earth is carbon-12. Both carbon-12 and carbon-13 are stable. Okay, carbon-14 is the unstable one, the one that decays over time. The difference chemically is carbon-12 has six neutrons and six protons. Six plus six is 12. 13 has seven neutrons, so it has the same charge, right? Neutrons don't have a charge. Protons are positively charged. Electrons are negatively charged. So carbon-13 has the same charge, but it just has an extra neutron, but that's stable. It turns out when you get to carbon-14 that has eight neutrons and six protons, that's the one that's unstable. That's the one that decays over time. So what happens when carbon-14 decays? Well, in the specific, there are multiple ways of decay, by the way. So this is not the only type of radioactive decay. In this particular example, what happens is a neutron gets exchanged for a proton. We're going to see a visual of this here in a second. So what this does on a chemical level is it changes the charge. So the element is no longer carbon, now it's nitrogen. And the reaction also produces an electron and an antineutrino. And I'm not gonna get into all that, but here's a picture of it. You've got carbon-14 on the left, and you can see nitrogen-14, and they've circled the little green thing there. The green thing is a proton, and over there on the other side you can see there is a blue thing that it gets re that it's replacing. So you have a neutron that's becoming a proton. It's changing the charge. You get an extra electron, and then you also produce a little bit of energy, an antineutrino. So all of that to say, how does this tell us anything about dating? Well, radioactive decay, again, is a process that's well understood. The half-life for carbon-14 is about 5,700 years. Now, what's a half-life? I'm using another scientific term here. What that means is if I had a certain amount of carbon, 14, from a statistical perspective, we'd expect half of it to be gone in 5,700 years. So it takes 5,700 years for that amount of carbon-14 to go away. Now, how does this work practically? Practically, how we can understand this is like if you have like a stick, for example, that gets buried underneath the surface of the Earth. It no longer can exchange with what's going on in the atmosphere. It can't exchange particles and things like that. So once it gets buried at age zero, it has 100% of the original carbon-14, whatever trace amounts of carbon-14 it had. Then in 5,730 years approximately, we'd expect to see 50%. 
And then in another 5,730 years, you'd expect to see another 50% go away. So now you have 25% of the original amount. And then in another 5,730 years, you'd have another half go away and you'd have 12.5% of the original amount. And so as things get buried, like fossils, for example, over time, they're no longer in contact with the carbon on the surface. And so as we dig them out, what scientists do is they check the amount of carbon-14 against what they would have expected, and that gives them an understanding of how old something is. And again, this is a well-known process. We've been using it for a long time, and it's been very helpful for us scientifically. And there's, again, there's no reason to believe that this relationship has changed over time, that the half-life of carbon has changed over time. Now, is carbon dating exact? The answer is no, it's not exact. It's not like you can date something to within like a month or a year or something like that. It is a statistical process. Uh, we're not there to observe the exact moment when an individual carbon-14 atom becomes a nitrogen-14 atom, okay? We're not there to observe that. But what we're saying is, statistically speaking, we can decide within a range. It can produce a range of possible dates. And we can be confident, based on statistical analysis, we can be like 95% sure that it's in this range. We can be 99% sure it's in this range. We can be 68% sure it's in this range. Depending on what kind of range scientists want to provide, uh, we can give a range of possible dates because it's a, a statistical process. So is it exact? No. But it does provide a very reasonable probable range of dates. So what is relative dating then? Well, relative dating uses geological principles like superposition and cross-cutting relationships uh, to provide estimates on how old certain features are. So imagine, for example, that you could date one layer of rock based on something you find in that rock layer. You can use carbon dating. And you find out that that layer is like 30,000 years old or whatever. Then the layer below that layer, again, assuming no tectonic activity in that location, you can say, well, that lower layer must be older than 30,000 years old. And so then you could give a range of dates there as well. So that's how relative dating works. Uh, we, we try to find uh, features that we can date absolutely. And then we go from there. We work from there and use deductive reasoning to get to uh, a relative dating of that particular feature. Transitioning now to the structure of the Earth. I don't know if you've ever read Jules Verne, Journey to the Center of the Earth, but the structure of the Earth has long been a hot topic among thinkers and scientists. And how do we know at what we think we know about the structure of the Earth? You know, you may have learned in in school about the core and the, and the mantle and the crust and all those things and the different features. How do we know that that stuff is the way that, that it is? No one's ever gone there. We haven't taken a, a shoot down into the ground and observed it. I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> Apparently the heat is really intense down there. <laughs> so how do they know? Well, scientists understand what waves do when waves go through various materials. So if you've ever known someone who is pregnant, and you went to an ultrasound, you know what I'm talking about. That's a medical imaging technology that uses sound, and you can see they've made really big advancements in ultrasounds, and you can actually do three-dimensional ultrasounds now, see the baby's face and stuff like that. It's really, really cool stuff. But anyway, we understand, scientists understand now what waves do when they hit various materials, and so when you think about earthquakes, for example, Scientists can take seismological data from earthquakes, and that's given us insight into the structure of the Earth. So a wave passes through one material, we know it goes a certain speed. And then if it goes into another material, often it deflects, and it slows down, or it speeds up. And so we can tell solid, liquid, if there are gas pockets, things like that, we can see that using seismological data. So this is the generally accepted understanding of the structure of the Earth. You've got the crust, you've got the asthenosphere, you've got the upper mantle and the lower mantle, you've got the outer core and the inner core. And again, we don't know precisely, we've never been down all the way to the center of the earth, but it appears that we have a solid metal core and that 
there's lava, there's in the mantle, there's liquid. And then when you get to the top, you get stuff that's habitable, that's solid, and that is the temperature that we need for things to survive, <laughs> including us. So this is a little bit about the structure of the Earth. Um, and again, this plays a little bit of a role of what we'll talk about when we talk about Noah's flood. Now, transitioning to the water cycle. The water cycle is perhaps the most important process that we observe geologically. Um, and it's the process by which water goes through the phases of solid, liquid, and gas. One of the most important things that the water cycle does is it helps moderate the temperatures on the Earth. So if you ever wonder why California, for example, has such a great weather year-round, it's because they're right next to a large body of water. That water, we talked about latent heat uh, back in our session on physics. Uh, the latent heat of that water, those, those properties of water, are really important and it helps moderate the temperatures on the earth. Also, you know, rain. Rain provides for crops. Rain provides for drinking water. You get wells and you get water below the surface of the earth, uh, groundwater, that's really important for supporting life, uh, both animal life and plant life and then, of course, human life as well. The water cycle is of vital importance. Here's an image of the water cycle from our friends at the USGS, the United States Geological Survey. And you can see uh, the water cycle as it, as it operates. And the big, the, big, the big phases are evaporation, where water transitions from liquid state to being a gas, water vapor. And then eventually that water vapor condenses together and gets heavy enough to where it falls as precipitation. And in certain uh, weather, that means rain, and other, uh, at other times that could mean snow or hail, depending on the conditions. So, but water transitions and flows through uh, all different environments. Sometimes it infiltrates into the ground and it goes into groundwater. People that uh, live on properties that have wells understand that, that there's water just in the ground, in the crust. And then a lot of water gets stored in lakes. It gets stored in the oceans, obviously, as well. Salt water does. And so this is incredibly vital, life-giving cycle that we have observed. Now, I'll briefly mention the carbon and nitrogen cycles. The carbon cycle is also incredibly important for the support of life. And this, these cycles also show how carbon and nitrogen experience going through the phases of solid, liquid, and gas. And you might have heard about the carbon cycle in the news because of uh, climate change. Because the disruption of the carbon cycle is one of the biggest fears of people promoting climate change. And so I don't know your perspective on climate change, and I'm really not going to talk about climate change. But really the focal point of the climate change debate centers on, a lot of it centers on, the carbon cycle. And it, our human interactions with the environment disrupting the carbon cycle on a level that is dangerous to our existence as a species and for life on this earth? That's a question I'll leave aside for the moment. We're going to finish by talking about plate tectonics. I, I wanted to give a brief history of plate tectonics uh, because it's sort of a funny story about how scientific theories change. And it's, been a, it's a very interesting study in geology. So ancients did not believe in tectonic separation. This is not something that the ancient we, we find a lot of ancient sources for. Now, one source from a while back, in 1620, Sir Francis Bacon noted that it looked like Africa and South America could have fit together like puzzle pieces. It was sort of a general observation about, hey, these look like they could have fit back together at some point. Over time, as we started building fossil evidence, some people started realizing, hey, there are similar animal fossils uh, located on the western coast of, of Africa and the eastern side of South America, you know, that's sort of interesting. And there were other pieces of evidence that started to get scientists' attention. But no one really proposed a, a theory of plate tectonics until 1925, when Alfred Wegener formally proposed plate tectonic theory. Now, the result of that was he was resoundingly ridiculed. I think it's, it's a classic example of what can happen in, in science where there is mounting evidence for a change of a theory, and because someone brings in something that's so different from the currently accepted theory, they get ridiculed. Instead of the evidence being weighed 
in the way that it should be, the preconceived biases of the current scientists in authority lead them to dismiss something out of hand. And it's fascinating. Unfortunately, in 1930, Wegener died while on expedition in Greenland trying to find evidence for his theory. So his response to the ridicule was to go back to the drawing board. Maybe if I find more evidence, people will accept my theory. And unfortunately, he died trying to support his theory. And about 35 years later, in the late 60s, almost overnight, his theory of plate tectonics reached scientific mainstream. So he wasn't alive to see it, but his theory did become the mainstream view, and it's the mainstream view to this day. Now, what evidence is there for plate tectonics? We have paleomagnetic data where, o over time, we know that the poles, we have uh, magnetic poles on both sides of the Earth. Over time, those poles have switched. Um, but we can see rock outcroppings now that are pointed the wrong direction, no matter if they switched or not. They're pointed the wrong direction. Well, how do you explain that? Well, at some point, they had to have been pointing the right direction. Then they moved. They got, they got shifted. Uh, I already mentioned the similar rock outcroppings that they've noticed between Africa and South America and in other places. There's also fossil evidence on both sides of the ocean. We find these fossils only on, on this part of Africa and this part of South America. We don't see them anywhere else. Why do we only see them on those two sides? There's a big ocean. This animal that's represented by the fossil couldn't swim across the ocean. So how'd that happen? We also know that the seafloor is spreading. We can see evidence for that in the geological record. We can also, the last one is, we can see the seafloor moving. We can see the plates moving. We can observe the movement. And it's very slow. Uh, I think the fastest plate in the world is moving at like six or eight inches a year or something like that. That's the fastest one. Most plates move like two to three inches a year, something like that. Briefly, I want to mention challenges to plate tectonics. Uh, where is the energy coming from? So we know that the moon uh, helps with some gravitational attraction that does something with the plate tectonics, at least that's our theory. There's also some theories about things under currents underneath the surface of the earth, like in the mantle, that could provide some energy. But we don't even with everything we know scientifically, we're not sure exactly where all the energy is coming from. So we don't know exactly why the continental plates are moving like they are. That's still an open question in geology and plate tectonic theory. And I want to mention this quote from John Erickson in his book on plate tectonics. It says, Even today, many questions pertaining to plate tectonics remain unanswered. Many exceptions to rigid rules have been found throughout the world. Although classical plate tectonic theory works well for oceanic crust, it has a difficult time explaining the motions of the continents. So again, they're open. I just give this as an example. Uh, plate tectonic theory is an example, first of how scientific theories can be overturned and how that process is often difficult. It takes time. It takes mounting a lot of evidence. So we can apply that to Big Bang. We can apply that to the theory of evolution. Other theories face the same kind of problems over time. And eventually, Every scientific theory in the history of science has been overturned at some point on some level. So it's important for us to, to see plate te tectonics as a great historical reminder of that. The other thing is that geological principles can be broken at times in localized areas, and that will be really important uh, for our discussion of Noah's flood. So as we conclude our discussion on geology, there are several concerns with geology as a science. The first one I mentioned earlier, the, the principle of uniformitarianism is impossible to directly prove, and so it's an assumption. And so uh, could there be phenomenal events that take place over here or over there that break that principle? Yes, and there have been examples of that. There was an island that popped up, I think, off the coast of Iceland that looked essentially fully formed. And geologists, if they hadn't literally observed this island coming out of the sea and, and seeing how a life sprouted and so forth, they would have thought that geologically it was much older, and yet we watched it sort of hatch and, and grow, and it seemed much younger. So anyway, the principle of uniformitarianism seems like a way we can attack geology, at least in localized situations, it seems like that could be broken. And then the other thing that I would mention is relative dating techniques can use circular logic at times. Like, for example, if you've got a layer and you're like, this layer usually is this old, we date this fossil, okay, and then we go to another part of the world and we say, oh, because this fossil is there, it's also this age. 
Well, if you go to different parts of the world and you take those kind of relative assumptions with you over time, it can be circular. And I think geology can fall into that trap on occasion. So that's just a little bit about the state of modern geology and about scientific theory in general, as we saw the case study with plate tectonics. So in the next session, we'll talk about Noah's flood and how it pertains to geology. Well, that brings this episode to a close. What do you think? Come on over to restitudio.org, find episode 473, What is Earth Science, and leave your comments there. Come on over to restitudio.org, find episode 473, What is Earth Science, and leave your comments there. And we- Come on over to restitudio.org, find episode 473, What is Earth Science, and leave your comments there. Who were not even willing to consider what evolution is and the possibility that someone could be an evolutionist and a Christian at the same time. And really my motivation there was just really was a concern over a kind of dogmatism that we find in Christianity today, that uh, there's been such a divide between faith and science for so long, and there's been incredible antagonism, especially in this country, the United States, at least since the Scopes trial, we could say, which addressed the subject of evolution in the year 1925 in Tennessee. But anyhow, that uh, people are just unwilling to even think about alternative interpretations or the possibility that some other view could be correct. And So I responded to that and really encouraged people not to be so exclusive and dogmatic in how they approach science-minded people, and really pointed out that it's important to keep in mind there's a difference between your current view of science and whether or not you're saved. These are two totally different things. And then I proceeded to lay out some of my reasons. I didn't really get into all of my reasons, but some of my reasons for why I still find the theory of evolution unconvincing, even though it is so popular and essentially understood to be necessary if you want to work in the field of biology, certainly, for most institutions. There there were a couple of things I didn't get into, which I, I sadly I didn't get it to mention the Cambrian explosion, but I feel like Will already covered that previously, especially in his conversation with Sam on YouTube. But also, the other one that I was thinking of after doing this episode was Alvin Plantinga's evolutionary argument against evolution, which is uh, admittedly a philosophical argument, but I think it's really logical. And so if you're curious about that, the gist of it is simply this. On evolution, survivability is always selected for. Professor Plantinga asks the question, well, what is better for survivability? Mild paranoia or an accurate understanding of your surroundings? In other words, he's asking an epistemological question about whether or not what's actually in, what's in your head, your perception of reality, correlates correctly to the world around you. And he argues that survivability would increase if we were somewhat deluded (laughs) and we were always a little bit anxious and paranoid because then then we would react better. And that doesn't seem to be the case. So he's sort of like assuming evolution is true and then running it through and finding that If that were the case, our psychological state would be different. It's obviously a lot more sophisticated than that. So if you're interested in Alvin Plantinga's argument against evolution, you have to look that up on your own. We got a number of comments in on that episode, which is good. It shows that people are interested, they're engaged. Kevin writes in, I have enjoyed Will Barlow's Science in the Bible lectures. I tend to take the Genesis story quite literally, but I believe that there are many things that scientists of all stripes have yet to learn and deal with. Kevin, I couldn't agree with you more. Science is still, in many areas, especially when it comes to the big questions, just beginning to understand. Uh, Last night at our Bible study, we had a lengthy discussion about quantum theory, uh, particle wave duality of light, 
the possibility of aliens and free will and the question of the soul, whether it's the same as the brain, is it the mind, is it something else than either of those? And uh, it became clear through the course of that discussion, which went on for some time, officially after our fellowship was over, not during it for the record. We rather keep speculations to, uh, to, to our free time. But anyhow, it became clear in that conversation that there are just so many questions that are still left unanswered and really speculating. And, wh- and one of the points one of the guys brought up was the whole issue of string theory as really helping to explain things. But to be honest, even with something like string theory, I don't know if any of you have read Brian Greene's Elegant Universe, great book, really helps explain a lot of where science was at about 20 years ago. I, I don't think that theory has much to commend it anymore. Uh, it doesn't seem to have produced any sort of evidence for its existence. I don't see it becoming adopted in any kind of useful way. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm wrong about that. It's an interesting theory, but if it's just a mathematical creation, that's interesting, I guess. But if it doesn't correlate to reality, who cares that you came up with this theory of how things might be. So anyhow, Kevin goes on to say, things like quantum physics, the electrical effects on cosmology and biology, ancient history, and out-of-place artifacts like massive ancient structures buried in submerged artifacts, ancient cosmological observation recordings, and the list goes on. A lot of the differences within science depend on the initial presuppositions of time. If a person presupposes long ages of time, then the data gets interpreted in that framework. And conversely, if someone like me believes in shorter time spans, then the data gets interpreted accordingly. The more I learn about time, the more I suspect there are occasions when time is vastly accelerated, like in the initial creation of matter, God's Big Bang. And then there may be occasions or locations when time is completely stopped, like in the creation of life. When dealing with life, it seems to require that all the components of life must be set in place, frozen in time, and then time gets turned on. But of course, this is purely speculative. There is so much we do not know, and we should always admit this up front. Can a Christian believe in evolution? Probably, as I do think that God will be somewhat forgiving of our ignorance, and provided that the evolution idea is not used as a basis to live contrary to God's moral standards. I just know that I will not be the final judge. Well, Kevin, that's a very gracious comment. Certainly appreciate it. Christopher writes in saying, What's sad about those comments, that's referring to the comments I read out in the last episode, What's sad about those comments is that they sound like how Trinitarians react to us. They don't even see they're behaving the exact same way. Same thing in regards to Satan and demons. In another note, I decided to try out that show alone. Well, Christopher, my friend, uh, just watch out. You might get sucked into alone. In the last episode, I kind of started my point using the TV show alone as an example, but that didn't really land the plane. Here's the point. The point is you take 10 professionally trained survival experts, you put them out in the middle of nowhere, you give them 10 items. They have a tarp, they have a knife, they have a ferro rod to start their fires. They have all these different things like a really warm sleeping bag and modern coats and thermal underwear, right? You give them all these things and then they still tap out after... Some of them after a week, some of them after 30 days or 40 days or 50 days. By 50 days, almost everyone is gone. They last maybe 70 days, and when they leave, they are emaciated. They are not able to survive. doesn't matter how good you think you are at fishing or hunting or whatever. Like Eventually, everybody is going to die, and they have to tap out. Or when the last person taps out in the show... They just pretty much immediately go and and get the last person to say, hey, you won. Uh, So, I mean, it really is a good lesson in how good humans are at surviving. Meanwhile, a stupid squirrel, I'm serious, a stupid squirrel. How big is the brain on a squirrel? It will survive in where I, I live in upstate New York. It could get 
negative degrees. It could get negative 10 degrees and stay there for days, right? Or what about in the Arctic? There are these squirrels that live up there, right? And they survive. They squirrel away their nuts and, and they're just, they're really good at surviving. Same thing with rabbits. Same thing with even big animals like bears or a muskox. And yet humans who are supposed to be the pinnacle of evolution, which means we are the most able to survive, we are terrible. We can last maybe 70 or 90 days using lots of modern technology and passed on knowledge. Meanwhile, a stupid squirrel can get dropped in and they're fine. That just blows my mind. I, I, I don't know that that's a real defeater to evolution, but it sure makes me think. Candace writes in, and she has some really interesting thoughts because she comes from a, a medical background. She writes in, Thank you so much for the entire discussion here. I am experienced in science and work in medicine as a profession, which I say only to give context to my comments. I apologize in advance for how pedantic my comment will sound, but I feel really strongly about this subject. Well, Candace, I appreciate you sharing your thoughts. We want to hear your thoughts. She continues, The majority of my friends and acquaintances are from work or previous training because it is very difficult to find like-minded individuals in church groups close enough to attend. The overwhelming majority of doctors and biomedical students I know immediately stop listening to any Christian evangelism because most Christians are not educated in science often referring to science as some sort of witchcraft, which is exampled here. And science people cannot relate to them. It is impossible to dispute or even discuss something you don't understand. Well, Candace, that's an interesting point. I'll just pause you here for a moment. Uh, there is prejudice really on both sides, isn't there? Science people are prejudiced against Bible-believing Christians, and they think we're dumb, and they think that we don't know anything because we're just simply not interested in learning their field of knowledge. And they likewise are uninterested in learning our field of knowledge. And uh, certainly on the other side, uh, which you point out very eloquently here, that Christians really look down on scientists a lot of times and say, you're just clueless, you don't know what you're talking about, and they just have no interest to engage. I would say the prejudice is both ways. Candace continues, if you don't understand even the basics of molecular and cellular biology, genetics, and even human physiology, you are completely ineffective, even silly, in discussions of evolution or other bioscience topics like medical treatments, vaccines, and antibiotics. Sure, you can have an opinion, but if I know you have never learned the basics of human creation, then your opinion really doesn't influence me. And you certainly won't convince anybody to investigate the gospel if they think you don't understand their world or care enough to get educated to discuss it. How brazen is it to walk into people's lives, know nothing about what they believe or understand, then start sweeping your hand over them. You're all wrong. All of that, all of this, it's all wrong. So in regard to science people, Christians have two choices. Abandon them entirely, or learn something about that which they understand and believe. The same way that Christians learn to engage with Catholics, Muslims, and injection drug users, all of whom are considered worthy to the evangelical Christian reformer, are those trained in science not also worthy, if harder to reach? To just walk away, throw your hands in the air, and say, well, that's all ungodly. No real Christian investigates or talks of this witchcraft is cowardice and intellectually lazy. Whew. Lastly, Yahweh is the author of this universe. The observations, right or wrong, that we make of his creation and call science can be another way of chasing him. Well, thanks so much, Candace, for giving us your thoughts. Obviously, not all Christians have the ability or the time to pursue education in science. And, you know, the word science, too, we could say it's kind of problematic because science can refer to many different fields. Uh, you're, you're talking more of biology and genetics and understanding human 
anatomy and physiology and so on, because you're obviously in the medical field. Uh, not everyone has a time or the inclination to, to do that, but I certainly hope that many of us do, that uh, God would raise up Christians, and I think he has, to speak to these issues. I think of Stephen Meyer, I think of James Tour, I think of Michael Behe, and, and that's on the non-evolutionist side. But then you also have people like Francis Collins on the evolutionist side and, and the, the whole team of scholars that's associated with BioLogos. I mean, look, there, there are a lot of these quote-unquote experts who are doing this hard work, but within the church, within the local church, I think Candace is right. And I, I'm sorry to be so fired up about this, but I just, prejudice drives me nuts. It really does. People would just dismiss out of hand whole chunks of the body of Christ simply because they interpret the science differently. That, that to me, it, it feels racist. <laughs> Maybe I'm just too much of a, a postmodern 21st century American Christian and uh, everything reduces to, uh, to, to these kind of categories. But, it, you know, that sense of prejudice where you're excluding somebody without even hearing what they have to say, it really bothers me. And look, if you're talking about the reasons for something, then I'm good. I don't care if, if you're arguing for a flat earth, right? Give me the reasons. Give me the scientific reasons you have for believing in a flat earth. Sure, I'll listen to them. Give me the scientific reasons you have for denying a landing on the moon. These are weird ideas, all right? But if you're giving me reasons instead of just saying, well, anyone that doesn't believe in the flat earth isn't a biblical Christian. That to me is, that is that's just prejudice. That's not, <laughs> that's a no-go. So I, th- I think we do need to, to cut those who disagree with us. If, look, if you're an old earther, Stop looking down on young earth creationists. Stop it. If you're an evolutionist, Christian, stop making fun of people that believe that God physically made the first two humans. And if you're a young earther, stop saying that people who have other views, like a gap theorist, aren't real Christians or they're, or, or they're, they're wackos, okay? These are not salvation issues. Their interpretations of how we work together, what we know of the world, and the Bible. So as such, we can cut each other some slack. And you know what? I want to have science people in my church. I have a medical doctor who, uh, who, who is an elder in my church. I have a, a, a chemist who's in my church. We have somebody with a degree in biomedical engineering in my church. And these are people that are not like out to get... Christians. They are Christians. They are Bible-believing Christians. I want to see Christianity reach all the different sectors. I, I want to see the gospel message reach poor people and rich people. Not just poor people, but poor people and rich people. Rich people need Christ too. I want to see the gospel reach uneducated people, the homeless, the down and out, the drug users, but also scientists, biologists, teachers, engineers, those people too. We, we have to be careful not to have prejudice against those whom God loves and sent his son to die for. I'm getting a little preachy here. I better, I better close it down. Well, next time we're going to be looking at the whole question of Noah's flood, and that's going to be great. Uh, I hope you'll listen to that. If you would like to support this ministry, especially with your year-end giving. We certainly appreciate that. At restitutio.org, you can donate. You can either make a one-time donation or you can set up a monthly donation, and a number of folks have set that up. There are some who are chipping in just a little bit every month, and it, and it really helps. And then there are others that make larger contributions, and that really helps too. We really appreciate all the support for those of you, especially in the month of December, which tends to be a time when a lot of people are generous and, and give. So thanks so much for that. We'll see you next time. And remember, the truth has nothing to fear.